happy that you could join us. And I was actually thinking that given, uh, given your uh, extensive experience and kind of, Anna, you have been um, in a way like spying in the boardrooms and executive teams of different kinds of companies uh, in the past um, years. So could you maybe just in your own words, tell us, start by telling us like, what is the change that you've been seeing? Impact was hardly the topic on everyone's minds. 10 years ago, but now things have changed. So what, what have you observed? Yeah, no, you're completely right. If you go back 10 years, um, it was very rare that, <clears throat> that a company would be thinking about any kind of obligation or any kind of proactive wish um, to have major impact or to be thinking for a minute that investors would care about. I mean, the whole ESG acronym didn't even exist at the time. Um, and of course, if I go back, historically, I think the first, I mean, there's of course a long history of sustainability, but even in where I come from, uh, I think the first time we had a sustainability practice was 15, 16 years ago. And so there was a period before the financial crisis um, which really started from the notion of renewable electricity becoming more affordable, or at least a view to that. And, and there were many companies, and there was a bit of this sort of, you talk about sometimes a warm period between ice ages, and this was a bit like that, um, where, where there was quite a bit of conversation and discussion, and, and we know that some companies that are very well known for what they do today were actually born at the time. Um, but I think the big thing that came in the way of people was, okay, everything, and I think Pavi was completely onto this, everything is dependent on regulation, and who would be so crazy to build an entire strategy that's at the mercy of regulators and regulatory decision-making? So only a few crazy people survived, plus people who said, okay, I don't want to be dependent on regulation, but I'll build a different story because I think I can make this work. It's not going to be more expensive. It's going to be as affordable as the conventional solution, and of course, we would know Tesla from those times. And, and their story also was around primarily, originally not about sustainability, but okay, let's cut the oil dependence um, because that's a good thing to do. So that was the story back then. And uh, if I look at what, what we see today, and, and maybe, sorry, before we come to today, what was the turning point? Um, again, I would buy with that. And I remember this, we were doing some work um, with a client and uh, they were very much as a whole regulation go and will the sustainability thing now become more important? And, uh, and I think it was, now I should have checked the exact date, but it was towards the end of 2019, when suddenly it was very evident that it was no longer regulators driving it, it was companies, but it's also cities. And I want to underline that because I think there was still a public sector aspect, but suddenly owners took this and said, okay, now, we see that this is going to be important. You know, Larry Fink had written the first of his many letters um, on the topic, and, and suddenly you could see that people are realizing that the equation is shifting. So investors are starting to ask for this. It's actually, there's possibilities of being more sustainable and more productive at the same time. Our customers are asking, our employees are asking for us to be more sustainable um, uh, or do something. Um, and, and so that was the change that happened, and I think Today, and, and I will now generalize for the sake of being a bit simple, I think you can see three types of strategies or approaches to, to sort of how you build this to strat into strategy. You have companies who are extremely confident, bullish, very well backed up, and are basically saying there is a massive growth opportunity. I mean, our net zero report that we published two months ago basically is saying that from now to 2050, if you want to do net zero, we need to put in three and a half trillion per year in completely new technologies and another roughly three in just deploying already existing clean technologies. So that's quite a lot of investment opportunity and therefore a lot of growth opportunities. You have companies like a mask who's saying, okay, if we're the first ones who can put in zero cargo, zero carbon cargo into end flows, and, and you know, that will be a huge competitive advantage. We'll order the ships, we'll buy the electric trucks, we will build the fuel plants because ammonia, e methanol isn't available, we'll build them, we'll invest in companies, we'll build ourselves. Because we are completely convinced that if we can get to scale first before anybody else will win. And so there's the, the, the type of strategies that are really growth focused, 
but at the same time super robust in terms of thinking about what do we need to do so that this is not 50 times or 50 percent mm -hmm. more expensive for our customers because we don't expect them to be ready to pay that much mm -hmm. they might be, be paying 10 or 20 percent more but it's not you know so so let's think about how we get this to scale so we get the cost down then you have the second category which are companies that are you know, when they create a strategy, they are thinking about how does sustainability play in? What do we want to do? What do we need to do? What do our customers expect? But they will still do the same thing, very much. And they will, you know, be very diligent in setting science-based targets and doing all the, all the roadmaps, etc. But it's fundamentally the same thing, just better. And then you will have companies that are very busy, maybe communicating <laughs> certain things, um, but don't really see that this will, you know, need to change what they do and how they do it, mm -hmm. or it is delegated to the margin. And then, you know, if you ask yourself, how does the movie end? Maybe uh, we can come back to that. But uh, I would say that the, the spread is huge. So I think most companies will probably think that, <laughs> or if you ask them, they would think that they are all doing as much as they could. But I, I still see a huge spread. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Risto. Um uh, any any comments or perspectives on what Anna just said? And uh, also an extra question for you, uh, looking at this from the perspective of a strategy for a company, what is the role of data? Is this kind of data we're looking at, is this just for the big picture for macro allocating resources by investors? Or does this have a role for uh, in the strategy of actual companies as well? I was thinking about this whole topic of course, on, on the way here and, and actually over the past several years. And one tends to get a little bit philosophical because this is a, mm -hmm. it's a fundamental question. And I have been a CEO for 20 years, been a chairman for over 40 years. I didn't even dare count the years I have been on as a board member in companies. And, and in, in businesses, we usually have you know, very high-flying targets and fancy words in our vision statements and maybe in our value statements. But when we do strategy, we, we are in search of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the opportunities we see don't fully match with the vision statement and the, the values and, and stuff like that. And I have always been a sort of a well-intended business person. I have looked to work with companies that I believe are doing good and I have always wanted to do the right thing myself. So I have worked with tech companies all only. But still the sustainability environment questions, they don't come up in strategy work as often as they should. Mm. And if we think about this, the philosophical part, if we think about how does the world really work, the, we have a very complex equilibrium of supply and demand and regulation that sort of impacts the natural market economics. And those apply to almost everything we see. When, when a company A is, is looking for employees, there's a supply of employees who want to work or candidates who might consider working for that company for a certain price. When the company is looking for certain types of supplies, there are certain suppliers that are interested in working with that company for a certain price and so forth for everything that the company does, for the capital it needs, for the customers that it wants to get and so forth. And those companies have various impacts, net impacts, mm. on, on the world we live in. So how do we change that equilibrium so that the companies having the highest positive net impact will get the best employees for a slightly cheaper price, will be favoured by the, the suppliers when there are scarce resources will be favoured by the, the capital markets. Customers want to buy from them because the, the halo effect shines on them as well. And they know that they are doing less damage or more good for the world. 
What do we need for that? Good intentions are not enough. We obviously need people to have trust in, in what they, how they are informed about the impacts these companies have and the strategies they have, the direction they are taking. And that's actually a big problem at the moment. Just so a couple of days ago when Elon Musk was complaining, when he was told that in MSCI data, Tesla was ranked in the sustainability index with the A category. And Shell had double A ranking. <laughs> And when we see these kinds of examples, it just erodes trust. Mm -hmm. And you know how people react when, when they don't know what to believe in anymore. They just mm -hmm. don't care. We are bombarded with conflicting data all the time. And that's, that's so damaging. We need to stop that somehow. But we also need simplicity. Because if, if it's really complicated, like even in your lay out all these different points of view with the SDGs and the EU taxonomy and, and the, of course, the upright model, that, that I like best because it takes both sides into account and it tries to provide a simple outcome, just a, a number or a percentage. But things are too complicated, so we need something that would bring the scientific rigor, that would bring the simplicity and that would create trust. And this is why I have been so excited about Upright for a number of years. Because you are trying to, to have a positive influence on this, this delicate equilibrium that I started with. So that the best people would go to the companies that mm. are doing the most positive net impact and the customers would favor them and so forth and so forth. And this is really something we, we all need to drive for, because we, the challenges we face in biodiversity, in climate warming, in scarce resources, in, in pollution of the environment, we won't solve them if we don't optimize the, this equilibrium so that we go in the right direction. So that's, that's my pitch for <laughs> everybody. Thank you for that as well. And I, I, guess, I guess what is needed, of course, we are trying to solve the data part, and that's where we're concentrated on. But equally important for that equilibrium to happen, and of course the challenge for us is to make it simple, usable, attractive, all of these things that we try to work on. But of course it is then up to the different actors, both in the private sector and elsewhere, but for example investors, to start utilizing more and more of this high-quality data, and maybe also like not go with the temptation to just use the... I don't know if the, the data point that pissed off Elon Musk was based on the number of SDGs that the companies have collected on their own websites, because Shell has them all, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> maybe that was the source. No, just kidding. It, MSCI data is not based on that. And by but, the way, wh yeah. when this happens, mm. then the strategy meeting will be more focused on these same goals as well. Exactly. But the strategy meeting, and it's not just about, and, and please also Anna comment, but I, I don't think it's even about, I mean, we are nerds and we love that the data is right, but that's simply not enough. We also need to make it simple and understandable enough. But what I really care about is how many people outside the company care about the data. That's the vehicle. Like as soon as it starts to impact where the best people graduating from the best universities want to work when it starts to impact uh, people like, well, many um, asset managers and other uh, of our clients uh, and potential clients uh, <laughs> listening as well right now, start to use this data uh, like as a basis for their investments. That's when it also starts to impact what's happening in the strategy rooms and, and in the executive uh, rooms. But regarding that, one thing that I would love to, because we tend to, when we talk about impact, we tend to a little bit, and I also myself sometimes find myself to make it simple enough, like you said, and this phenomenon is far from simple, to just talk about kind of like nice and not so nice companies. You talked about just like net positive and, and, and maybe not that positive. One thing that, that I think is still uh, a bit lagging in the current discussion is sometimes thinking about the, that the things we need to steer away from are the so-called bad things, like, okay, tobacco and guns and whatnot, and all of these like, uh, like obvious choices. 
But more and more, when we really look at, for example, the IPCC reports or some research that you guys do or what, 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 wherever we look at, we realize that that is not enough. It's not just enough to cherry pick like 3% of bad stuff and, and take that out and then be like, oh, we are all like holy green <laughs> companies. And but what know, even, even guns look much better today mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. they looked yes, half a year exactly, ago. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's a whole, whole other topic. But really what, what I sometimes like to use, and that's why I sometimes try to avoid the word sustainability and really talk more about even resource use, like the efficiency of resource use. If we are going to, the same goes with like spending money in a company. If we're going to use a certain amount of emissions, what really comes out? And there it might even be not so much the so-called bad things, but the things that are just simply not justifying their resource use, like a disposable plastic fork. It's not bad, it's a simple thing you use on a picnic, but can we really afford to create emissions just because someone was too lazy to do the dishes. And this might be a completely new discussion for strategy rooms as well, or, or like executive boards as well, because this is not just about whether you are in tobacco. Many people, for example, working with digital services are usually thinking of, hey, we do everything great. I just spoke with uh, a lot of great, great entrepreneurs working in mobile gaming, and they are working on their emissions, and they talk like, Phew. Good luck we don't work in mobile devices. Ooh, there's like crazy emissions there. And I'm like, come on, you guys, like your product cannot be used without a mobile device. It like simply cannot exist without the other part of the industry that you are now looking down on. Uh, that's, of course, also a value chain point. But really, like, uh, maybe my very, very long question or rather wondering is that how do you think this is, like, is this already something that executive teams should prepare for, that their business is not only looked at like, okay, so you, you don't do guns or tobacco good, but in a whole new scrutiny for resource use is also being uh, subjected to companies. Yeah, I think many of the existing forces at play might already force that, right? So if you are looking at your footprint, they are looking at, okay, so we now made a science-based target commitment, how do we, how do we drive down emissions? Um, you will you know, come to a certain point by doing simple things and then you may start asking yourself, okay, what about our business portfolio? Mm -hmm. um, is this really future-proof? And your famous plastic forks are, of course, already out of the window in, in the European context with the single-use plastic mm -hmm. directive. But, but even more so, I think there's, there is increasingly a question of which businesses should we really be in? Mm -hmm. um, and where do we have a growth outlook? I mean, plastic forks, sorry, maybe not so much. Uh, and there are other businesses like that. Um, I, in, in resource productivity, of course, if all resources were correctly priced, resource productivity would automatically come out of every boardroom because mm -hmm. of economic optimization. And I think what maybe then needs to happen increasingly is the correct pricing of resources mm -hmm. and externalities, which, you know, ETS is, is, is one version of that. And, and uh, of course, the scarcity of certain resources will also bring about some of that. So I think many economic mechanisms should go hand in hand. I mean, in 2006, when we started, it was called sustainability and resource productivity, yes. our practice. So it, it's not a sort of foreign thought. I think conceptually for many boardrooms, it will be quite difficult to take a, are we using our emissions right lens? Because that's relatively far from what, no, no corporation's mission as such is to produce emissions. Mm -hmm. So it will have to come through some of the other mechanisms. Uh, but there, I think we are really seeing companies start to question their business portfolios. So I do think that those type of movements are underway. Mm -hmm. I was really excited when I talked to uh, one of our clients who already had a supplier of theirs basically say that they wanted to know it was a logistics company. And before the supplier, which is a really relevant, powerful supplier that they really needed to buy from, was basically asking that, uh, can you commit to not... Um, uh, to not putting uh, certain things that, like, basically, they were they were asking, like, what are you going to move around with this uh, equipment? And if you are not committing that there will be cer not certain uh, products with more and more um, like an em emission level, we will not sell this product to you. And I think these kinds of examples are really inspiring in terms of what what companies are starting to do. And this is something that obviously has been a risk happening in the strategy or like a, like a really bold, bold statement coming from the, from the company, but also because it is something that they need to then report on what is happening with our products. They are taking more and more responsibility for the value, value chain. Risto, you mentioned that you would like to see um, uh, like the 
employees when they're choosing where they are going to work, the smartest brains to work on things that are uh, uh, net positive or, or better in terms of net impact than others. What is needed for that change to happen? Well, I think people need to understand or have an easy way to, to figure out what the net impact of various employment opportunities are for them. And they need to be able to trust on that, that data. And today we miss out on both of those. Mm. What I'd really like to see is, is companies being able to tell their employees that, hey, we are, we are here at the moment in terms of our impact. Our plan is to get there. And we'll report to you on a quarterly or at least annual basis mm. on how our journey progresses towards the target. I think that would be highly motivating for, for employees of any, any business and governments mm. as well. So we need to set the targets, we need to communicate them clearly, we need to have a way to, to monitor where we are going, and then we need to have a process of, of steering and making changes and decisions mm. to correct the course. And this needs to be transparent. And I, I don't think a company has to be hugely net positive at the moment to, to attract good people. Mm -hmm. They need to have the ambition to become hugely mm -hmm. net positive. And, and that will be enough. Mm -hmm. But then they need to communicate that and one needs to be able to track the mm -hmm. progress. The same applies to investing as well. It's not just like we get asked a lot, can you be a responsible investor if you invest in a company whose net impact is net negative when you get started? It's about the delta that you can get done during your investment period or during the period you work there. It's actually a huge impact to go to a really old-fashioned uh, mm -hmm. company stuck in fossils. If you think you're, for example, an executive or a product engineer, that can make a big difference there. The delta will be, will be uh, uh, what really matters. So being able to track that delta, that change uh, during that time is, is really important. Anna, you work with, uh, a lot with, uh, with sustainability strategies with companies. Um, one of the things that are uh, common these days is to talk, uh, and, and given this complexity that Risto was just talking about, this topic is difficult. And sometimes there is a like, temptation for executives to also, let's just put in something simple. And that's typically when either charity or compensation comes to question. Uh, what is your view on charity and compensation in terms as part of the sustainability strategy? Yeah, compensating emissions, you mean? Yeah. Um, emissions reductions are clearly better. They are actual real impact. So I think it's really hard to have a f f sort of fundamentally robust sustainability strategy without actually... It, well, let me put it this way. Um, you can, of course, have a very strong growth-oriented strategy, and then in new areas that are related to sustainable services and technology scaling. And then you need to, of course, take care of your own footprint. If taking care of your own footprint is done without you actually reducing emissions, you're cheating yourself and others. So, uh, of course, the primary goal for you need, will need to have to actually work on your own emissions um, and you, then your value chain. So, uh, you know, of course, there is a place for many kinds of instruments. And, uh, you know, but in the end, it's just, it's really hard to get to net zero if people don't reduce their emissions. <laughs> it just doesn't work out. Yes, that is what the math is suggesting. Risto, what do you think? Well, there needs to be a price on, mm -hmm. on damaging the, the environment or the society. And, and that encourages companies to steer away from those. Mm -hmm. And of course, the pricing mechanisms are rarely perfect. They are typically established by, by politicians who are influenced by political decisions like we have just seen in Europe regarding the discussion on nuclear and, and peat mm -hmm. and a number of other things. And again, these discussions and the, some of these decisions take away from the credibility and the trust, mm -hmm. which is really damaging. But we just need to try to, to feel our way forward the best we can in, in creating the right incentives for companies to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Business leaders typically want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but the structures around us don't always support us in, mm -hmm. in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to make it easier for business leaders to 
to make the right thing because that's essentially what every every one of us as human beings want to do. I have never myself met a single investor or a company executive or entrepreneur who would rather destroy more value than they create. It goes without saying. It's just a matter of getting these things as, as numbers. And like we talked with, with Anna Yu uh, a couple of weeks ago when we, when we met before this event, uh, just uh, at least for me, it was a great uh, eye opener when we modeled some of our companies with charity and compensation and without them. And we saw that it hardly even moves the needle. And the, there's a big problem with the compensation pricing today. And um, there's even like a threat that if you think that, okay, this is now a way for the strategy team to solve the problem by just ticking the box uh, uh, with some, some projects that look nice, uh, that is not necessarily even business wise a very smart decision for them given how that will then look in quantifications and so on. And if I may say, I would say that reducing your emissions is not a strategy. It's like cutting cost is not a strategy. Mm -hmm, yeah. The question is, what do you do then? Mm -hmm. How aggressive are you if you think that you can be completely superior to your comp competition by being much faster to a much lower footprint, monetize that in one way or the other? That's called a strategy. Just reducing our emissions, let alone going for compensation, not really a strategy. Mm -hmm. It's just actions you take and they might be good actions but just want to highlight that the bar for strategies is slightly higher. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it is actually a good question how many companies actually do have a sustainability strategy then. But that's, I guess, something you work on on a daily basis. I think our time's up. Thank you so much, Anna and Risto. Let's give a warm thanks to, to Anna and Risto for joining us on stage. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.